I'm Scott Al Miller. This is my life living in Leon, Nicaragua. Today we had so many people send in questions all like in one day that it's awesome we're able to do a uh, Q&A episode based off of a single day's question. We must have hit one of those days where the content just prompted a lot of people to ask things. So thank you so much. I love it when we do these. So we have a variety of short questions that we're going to get to today. We're just going to run right through them and answer as much as we can all in one day. So thank you for sending those in. We're going to get to all of those right after the bump. Before we get into today's questions, I do want to do a little follow-up on the cafeteria story that I posted in the shorts just the other day, because a lot of people commented on it, and I think it, it takes some background to understand what happened. It is a pretty funny story, however. So I was at the cafeteria. This is at the hospital in Managua. So this is an independent cafeteria, but it is inside the hospital. So this is not some place that's like drawing you in with its amazing food, even though the food is supposed to be pretty good. I don't know, because I never got any. But in theory, it's supposed to be a pretty decent cafeteria. It's very nice. It just So we went in. There's three of us. We sat down. We ordered. We had about 30 minutes before someone had to have a, uh, just a checkup. So like we got plenty of time. We're just ordering, you know, uh, gallo pinto and eggs. Like it, it takes five to ten minutes typically for almost any place to make food. And it was not very busy. There were about three tables when we got there. And it's not a big cafeteria, but they have a very large staff. They have like three or four people in the kitchen and at least five servers. So they're very overstaffed for what they are. Actually, that can sometimes cause problems. But we ordered the food. We waited the 30 minutes that they had. And then they're like, okay, the food hasn't come yet. We're going to run and do uh, the, the appointment. That should only take 15, 20 minutes. So just get the food covered. We'll come back and it won't be that cold when we get back. So I waited on my own. It ended up taking them a lot more time than expected. So I didn't push for the food to come out. I could have flagged them down and been like, dude, 30 minutes, 45 minutes, what's going on? But I didn't want to bother them that early because I was actually hoping that the food would be a little bit more delayed. It had already been delayed way too much. So I was hoping it would be delayed a little bit more so that when they came, it would be ready or at least closer. It wouldn't be so cold. But their stuff overran, took way more time than expected. So it ended up being 75 minutes before they came down and they weren't able to get phone signal uh, in the hospital. And so they weren't able to tell me that they were coming back. So when they came back, they're like, wait, the food isn't here yet? I'm like, no, there hasn't been a single peep. And the whole time I wanted more coffee. We ordered coffee when we first arrived and they were a little bit weird about that. We had ordered coffee from one person and they brought it, but another waiter came over and said, no, you have to tell me your coffee order. We told it to him. I think he never put in any order at all. And we got the original coffee. That is my I guess. I don't actually know. But uh, so so we had coffee, but it was very small and I was hoping to get more. Our waiter never returned. We ordered this initial coffee. Two waiters came over, took our order, brought the coffee within two minutes. And then that was it. Never got a waiter again. But a waiter walked by, made eye contact a hundred times. I have no idea. We're in a tiny room, really small room. So there, like every single person would could see me at every moment and see everybody. Like, it was so incredibly just obvious what was going on. So they came down and they're like, no, we have another appointment in five minutes. We got to do something. So at that point, it, by, by the time all this had happened, it was about 90 minutes. And uh, my wife talked to uh, the waiter and was like, okay, this is ridiculous. We've been waiting for 90 minutes for eggs. And at this point, for when we ordered, it was like three tables. But by the time it was about 15 minutes I had been waiting, I was the only table. I was the only person. It was just me sitting there waiting for food. The entire restaurant was five servers and multiple people in the kitchen, all of them in theory dedicated to making me a plate of eggs and rice that should have taken five minutes with a single person. And uh, any, any street vendor could have just handed it to me, right? Now, I wasn't starving, so I wasn't worried about this, but I did want more coffee. But I didn't want to flag people down and be like in the way and like, whatever. So at 90 minutes, my wife's like, no, okay, so we have this one bagel that we ordered, we need that. And they're like, oh, that was just about to come out. And she's like, it was after 90 minutes, not, not one word said, not one thing done. It was about to come out after 90 minutes. So they rushed out with this one bagel, which was just a lender's bagel that they warmed up and slapped cream cheese on like 30 seconds. That's, that's all it took. Remember, we're the only ones there. And then the, and then she canceled the rest of the food and she's like, this is, we, we don't want it anymore. Right. So I, but I still sat at the table waiting to place an order for more coffee. Now, again, I wasn't flagging people down, but I waited for a total of three hours and finally gave up. And then it took at least 10 minutes just to pay the bill. They never brought me a bill. They never generated a bill. I had to walk up, tell the person at the front what I had gotten. They had no idea. Uh, and then, and then paid for that. It, the whole thing was 
absurd, really. Now, the thing is, a lot of people made comments about things being slow, and that is not what happened, right? And, and Nicaragua is not actually known for being slow. That's a thing that people joke about, but people joke about that anywhere, right? But in reality, a lot of things in Nicaragua happen very quickly. But what is different culturally, and this is what is really going on, there is a cultural trend. So in the United States, we have a really strong ex expectation to one side, which is that people will stop by your table and harass you. People will try to turn over the table. People will bug you. They'll ask you for things. They'll bring you things proactively. You don't expect to ever yell. You know, you at most you're gonna kind of look up, barely catch your attention. Waiter, what do you? What can I help you with? Right? That is our expectation. The moment that you have, we believe, completed a meal, we want to hand you <laughs> the receipt or the 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 bill. And they want to move you out. They want to get on to the next person. So there's there's they do all these things to generate more money, and some of it is customer service based. Some of it is purely trying to get you out of there and speed things along. In Nicaragua, they don't try to speed things along. It's more like Europe where they let you sit and relax. So that's one thing. But there's also this really strong cultural trend where they don't bother to come check up on you. They will never, under normal circumstances, they yeah, a nice restaurant once in a while. But in general, no one is ever going to come to your table unless they're needed. So if you order food and they forget that food, they are culturally just leaning towards completely ignoring tables that are sitting there and completely ignoring that you might have something you want. Does he want more water? Does he want more coffee? Could I upsell him on something? They will never come check. If you want a waiter in many restaurants, you are expected to be like muchacho and like get his attention, often screaming across the restaurant. And El Vivero, very popular, very successful restaurant here in Leon. If you want any service at all, chances are you're going to be screaming throughout the entire meal. Every single thing. You want a water. You want your food. When you wonder why your food hasn't arrived, because it takes forever to get food there, right? Because it's normal to spend an hour waiting for mozzarella sticks, right? The simplest thing. And you're screaming because no one will come to your table. They won't stand by your table. They won't come within earshot. They won't make eye contact with you. They will avoid eye contact, even in popular restaurants. They'll look over you. They'll make sure no one's on fire, but they will not look at you in the eye. So you can't grab them unless you're doing this. Once in a while, that will work, but normally you have to scream. It's just how it is. It's a cultural thing. And a lot of tourists feel that customer service here is very bad because they, they it's not at all what we expect or are used to. And it doesn't make any sense to us as North Americans. Why would you want a restaurant that isn't selling as much as possible? It intentionally lowers the profits. In America, the reason we do those customer service things is to make more money as a restaurant. And it's amazing how often I can tell you, I go to restaurants and it takes me so long to order another beer, so impossible to order dessert. We give up and we just don't bother. So if I would have had three beers, I'll only drink two or maybe one. If I would have had a meal and an appetizer, I just have the meal. I can't put up the effort. I don't have the time to grab somebody. I just don't want to deal with trying to convince someone to sell me more stuff. And so it really does. And everyone I know, Nicaraguans say this too, they so often just can't get another beer that they end up going long periods of time without a beverage or whatever because they can't get someone. And, and when they place the orders, people always forget something. And because they never check back, it, it's like you have to order all over again because you have to flag someone down. It's often a different part. Like, it's just so much. So that is a cultural thing that's happening. So what happened here, I guarantee, is they this guy tried to take over the table. He completely fumbled uh, the thing, never put the order in, I guarantee. And then because he was so just used to completely ignoring a table, no matter how obvious. It is that they want something or are waiting for him or whatever. They don't like making eye contact. They don't like having to excuse why the kitchen's taking 10 minutes instead of five, whatever it is. So they don't. But because of that, if something goes wrong, it exacerbates it instead of solving it. The American system, if you forget something and you check back in, you're like, yeah, I had an order of fries with this. Oh my gosh, I forgot your fries, right? They're on top of it. You don't have to flag them down normally because they're checking in. But here, because they're avoiding checking in, even when they have forgotten something, those checks and balances that we're used to, that would cause them to be like, wait, weren't you supposed to have food? Why have you been sitting here for three hours with no food? Oh my gosh, that's on me. I didn't bring you your food, right? That that trigger that something's gone wrong with a table just doesn't exist in a lot of cases. That's what happened here. And so all these people working are so completely just ignoring the fact that I'm at the table that it never occurred to them to stop by and say, wait, you were here for a reason and that reason never happened. And you've been here through entire meal shifts and nothing was ever done. Something must be wrong. And of course, some people were coming in and be like, well, he's just always been here. Whatever's wrong is already wrong. It's not my problem. And that's the other thing, no one taking ownership. All right, let's get to the questions. 
All right, our first one up is from Mr. Frodo1111, who, uh, responding to some of our talks about importing vehicles and stuff, sounds like what I had mentioned before of driving for six months down Mexico to Nicaragua would be perfect if I can stay 30 days in Nicaragua, a few in Guatemala, Costa Rica, Honduras, pick a place I want to permanently settle in, drive back to the USA, and then sell off the car or drive it back once I have the residency. Absolutely. That is a working plan. Generally, you're not going to want to bring it in with residency, but you might because you already own it. But in many cases, and we're going to, there's, there's several comments on here about uh, importing vehicles. So, so if you have questions, stay tuned. We may get to it. Um, in many cases, you're going to want to sell it and then come down and buy a new car. But yes, if you're going to spend that time, even six months going from place to place, only hitting 30, maybe 60 days in each different country, then having uh, go back to the US. So you reset that, you, you get rid of all those imports, you're back to where the car belongs, assuming you came from the US. Uh, that's a great way to do it. Then if you're going to get residency at some point, coming down and and deciding how to bring that car in with residency is what's likely going to make sense. It's a completely different picture. When you already have residency, you've arranged to bring the car and you've verified that the car is going to make sense for you than just driving down whatever you have and leaving it here and hoping for the best. So I think that's a really good idea. When you're coming down and using a car and driving around and using it as part of an exploration process that goes on for quite some time, but you're not staying in a single jurisdiction, you really are just a long-term tour tourist that is moving from country to country and all those countries will understand that and you're doing exactly the thing that they're expecting when they allow you to bring in a car for a temporary amount of time so yeah absolutely perfect that could be a really great idea still a lot of work there's a lot of negatives to driving all that time than having a car for six months but it is a scenario where like even if you didn't have a car that would be a really difficult uh, uh process to do so the car is not the big problem there and may solve a lot of problems along the way all right, uh, David Legrand, 2931, asks, Scott, is it safe and economical to rent a car or motorcycle while in Nicaragua? So it's absolutely safe. Like, that's not a problem. Is it economical? That's the toughest thing. Now, a motorcycle is very hard to rent. They do exist, but they're very, very hard to find. So just be aware that basically every time someone asks that, we end up being like, I don't know where to get a motorcycle. In theory, Casa Pellas has them, but I've never actually seen someone do it successfully. So just good luck. Renting a car, you're going to go through a rental agency. Of course, what's going to happen is going to be quite expensive. Remember, Nicaragua has a fraction of the cost of living in the United States, but when you're renting a car, often it is about the same. It can be even more than the U.S. because cars are not a discount here. They are, if anything, a premium. And so, you know, we have more traffic accidents. We, you're less likely to die in an accident because it's at lower speed, but you're more likely to be in a fender bender. You're more likely to get nicked up. So insurance on cars ends up being relatively high, and the rental car is pretty high because the actual cost of the car is pretty high. Now, yes, the cost of the labor of the person who cleans it's a little bit lower, but that doesn't really offset the higher cost of, of uh, parts and, and the actual car itself. So you end up with rentals here costing basically the same as they do in the United States or just a slight bit more, which really throws you off because everything else in Nicaragua is so cheap. The thing that makes this very difficult is that if you were to take public transportation, that does get affected by Nicaragua prices. So in the US, you'd be like, ah, public transportation, that would cost me $10. Here, you're like, it would cost me $1. Oh, that's a completely different thing. And if you're looking at hiring a private driver, often it's like, oh, I could get a private driver for the entire day for less than the cost of a rental. Well, in that case, it's very hard to call a rental affordable. So while, yes, if you're looking at it in absolute numbers and saying, well, if I was in the U.S. and I was staying for two weeks, I would rent a car for two weeks and I'd spend all this money and then I'm going to Nicaragua and could I do it for about the same money? Sure, that's probably true. You probably can. I bet it'll be more, but I don't think it'll be a lot more. But what will be unaffordable is that you won't be getting the advantage or the view into the Nicaraguan low prices because you're doing something that we just don't do in Nicaragua. So yes, it's very doable and safety is not a problem. Driving here is not specifically dangerous. It's a little bit complicated, but not bad. Mostly it's confusing, but at very low speeds. So uh, yes, sometimes the big circles and stuff in uh, the, the roundabouts in Managua can be frustrating. Um, once in a while, you're going to be on a hill where it's a little bit hard to drive, but but most of Nicaraguan driving is, is quite straightforward and simple. Uh, only the colonial cities really have those tight streets that get really problematic. I do find uh, Matagalpa to be a little bit of a, a struggle to navigate at times because of the Rio Grande coming through the middle of the city. 
and uh, and of course any hills there are always you know some potential for for difficulty to navigate uh, but from a purely safety perspective like the chances that you're going to you know be killed because you're driving down the road and there's so many you know cars flying everywhere and it's just super dangerous no it's it's really not like that it's more like you're creeping down the road and someone didn't look and they bumped into you and they scratched up your car and then that's it, that kind of stuff happens non-stop or you know someone didn't look stepped out in front of your car and they bounced off your hood that happens quite a bit as well now the things that we do say is if you're coming to most any country, consider carefully whether or not you want to spend your vacation or limited time driving because it's just there is headaches to it. There's navigation you got to do. There's a lot of things that come up and there are potential dangers. The thing that people will tell you is if you're, especially if you're a foreigner, this, this goes for everyone. If you are involved in a really dangerous car accident, that is a fatality, obviously, or, or seriously bodily harm, until such time as the police are able to ascertain who is at fault and determine what to do, you may be held in jail for that. That does not mean you're being, you know, detained indefinitely. It does not mean the end of the world, but it's generally a really negative experience on your vacation to be spending time in a jail cell, even if it's only a few hours, but more likely in many cases, it's 48 to 72 hours because there's a lot of process that has to go through. And especially if someone's dead, they, they may not have everything that they need. They may not be able to get through the courts that fast. Some things just move a little bit more slowly here. And so we generally recommend that you really consider carefully if you need to rent a car. If you absolutely need to, it's fine. And driving is not a big deal. And I drive, most everyone I know drives. We all have cars and we're not renting them, we own them, but right, it's a, it's a very normal thing. I drive nearly every day. I'm about to go driving in just a little bit. It's fine. But if I was here on vacation again, if I was doing it, if I was in your shoes, I would almost certainly either just opt for public transportation if that met my needs, which it probably doesn't. That's why you're looking at renting. But if it did, seriously, the public transportation is fantastic and interesting. So cheap. But if you feel that you need the flexibility of a car, it may cost more, but it may cost less. It's going to be relatively close. I would find a reliable driver, I realize that's hard to do from afar, but put some research into that. Find someone who will be a driver, who will provide the car, who will drive for you, who will navigate for you, who will spend the entire time with you. If you need to, hire them for two weeks and put them up in a hotel that moves around with you or find someone from the town you're gonna go to, or whatever, be creative, but find someone to drive you around instead. And in many cases, when you're renting a car, you're not driving continuously. It's just, you know, these few days and then these few days, um, figure out how to do that with uh, a hired driver, maybe different ones from different towns, and then don't have to worry about that stuff. You'll probably get a discount on the car. You'll definitely be safer on the road. You'll definitely not have to worry about the police. If, if anything goes wrong with the police, the taxi driver takes care of that. And they're not going to go to jail because they, the police have ways to, to track them. They know who they are. They're not a foreigner who could flee the country or something, right? Because they have to deal with that with you. They don't have to, with a taxi driver. Um, and, and just all these things. It makes life so much easier normally. I'm not going to say there's not exceptions. I'm not going to say that there aren't reasons why you might want to rent a car. But by and large, if you're thinking of renting a car, think more that probably hiring someone to drive you will just make your vacation or your exploration of whatever a little bit more relaxing and possibly not even more expensive but it's a it's a good investment in making you able to just spend your time enjoying things Another car importing one from Rudy C27. What would you think about importing a 2018 Jeep Wrangler? Would it be too much attention? Would it be high fees or taxes? So when I tell my stories of the ultimate bad vehicle that I know someone who they imported and it completely ruined their life and it was the dumbest thing they could ever have done. It took a move to Nicaragua from being a casual, wonderful experience to being they never got to enjoy the country and every moment of their life was dealing with having brought in a vehicle that was both an import when it made no sense to be and was a vehicle that stood out and could not be serviced in country, could not get parts and drew attention like you wouldn't believe. It was a Jeep Wrangler. This is one of the absolute worst things you could bring to the country. Now, anything like it, anything. So we're going to talk in a little bit about why you don't bring any vehicle ever to the country if you actually want to drive it. If your goal is to drive, bringing it in doesn't make sense. So ask yourself, what would make you even want to bring in a Jeep Wrangler? What is the purpose? Because it's not going to do anything positive for you, but it will draw, it will get an, an immense amount of attention. You'll be pulled over all the time. Uh, and not just 
when you're getting, so normally you're pulled over at random, right? You're going down the road. They pull you over if you're doing something for sure. They'll pull you over if you really stand out and they'll pull you over at random, say every 10th car, every fifth car, they'll have different patterns on different days. And there are days they do every car. So just be aware. But if you're driving something like a Jeep Wrangler, what happens is sometimes they pull you over for non-stops, meaning they just want to check out your car. And if you, that happens once, because you should never have, there should never be a scenario where you've imported a, something like a Jeep Wrangler. A, a, a wild car like that should never, ha this just shouldn't happen, right? So if it does, the police think nothing of pulling you over to check out your car because they're the police and they can do that, right? For you, however, when you may go through on some days, you know, you're doing a casual drive, you live in Leon like me, you want to go to Managua to do some shopping, you decide to do it, maybe it's a festival day, you're not going to the festival, but there's a little bit of extra traffic, you may find out that there are five stops between uh, Leon and Managua. Now, when they're pulling over every 10th car, the chances that you get pulled over on a round trip is you're only going to average being pulled over once, and that stop is normally about 30 to 45 seconds. Oh, you pull over, you roll down your window, buenos dias! You immediately hand your paperwork out the window, you're completely ready. They go, oh well, yeah, everything looks good. They kind of look around your car, hand you your stuff, and have a good day. And that's it. That's the interaction under most circumstances. So doing that once during a day of driving is nothing at all. And you can thank everyone for keeping the roads incredibly safe. It's a system that works really well. But if you're driving that Jeep Wrangler, that same day, you may be pulled over 10 times. And every one of those interactions may be a trying to talk to you about the car in a much more lengthy thing. And instead of 30 seconds, it could be three or four minutes. They're not going to harass you, but the very act of just paying attention to your car is going to feel like harassment really fast. And that's what happened to my friends who did this. They came down. They couldn't go anywhere without the police pulling them over. They never gave them a problem. That's not true. They did give them some problems, but not very much. Uh, they had like Casey lights and stuff and those you're not allowed to have, right? So they had they had modified their, their vehicle in ways that it was not street legal. They had also brought it in with a trailer, which caused all kinds of problems. But just that it was a Wrangler, anytime they drove, they could drop their trailer, they could take off the KC lights. If they drove down the road, the police wanted to see the car. And so it made it that they were, one, just always observed. There was no anonymity ever. And two, they could never go anywhere without expecting to be spending time speaking with the police about their vehicle because every cop in the country found it interesting. And so that is something you absolutely want to avoid. We're going to talk in just a little bit because there's another question about importing vehicles in general. And, and I think that'll cover some really key other information about this when we get to that question. But um, specifically anything that stands out will be a disaster for you. Now, if you're bringing down a Ferrari and every time you go out, you want to be stopped. You're like, hey, we're going to drive real slow and roll through town and we're just going to put the top down and we're going to blast the music and we're going to see every cop. We're going to see every kid. We're going to see every, you know, that's fun. When I lived in Italy, I one time I was standing out getting ice cream with my kids and a Testarossa just pulls up. They're just out for a Sunday drive. This is not someone going somewhere. They're not traveling in their Testarossa, right? This is over a million dollar antique. This thing just pulls up. And the guy just looks over at us. He sees my kids sitting there and their kids are with ice cream because they know Ferraris, right? They were really little at the time. And they're both there looking and the guy just looks at my kids and he was coming down real nice and slow. He just pulls up and he just dropped it and lit him up for him, right? And just tore down the road. If that's what you're doing, you're out showing off your car and you're just rolling through town. You want to be seen. You want to be like a spectacle of I've got a really cool car and it's fun for people to come out and check it out. Yeah, by all means, then you can bring this down. If your goal is to bring this down and actually think it's going to be a working vehicle for you, then no, absolutely don't don't do that with any vehicle, especially not one like a Jeep Wrangler. And of course, we're gonna we're gonna get to it. How are you ever gonna get that fixed? All right, see if I can pronounce this from Mike Ukrainitz. Great info and something I've looked into previously prior to purchasing property in Nicaragua. The odd thing is, as a Canadian, is the cost of replacement for a vehicle. We've been told similar that we should sell and purchase a vehicle when we live in Nicaragua. The problem, being a Canadian, is our dollar is ridiculously inferior to the U.S. dollar. Okay, we're going to stop right there. Remember, this should never be said. That means there's a misunderstanding of how currency works. That is not a thing that applies to anything. So it's some, there's something being missed. I know a lot of Canadians get this like marketing or propaganda that their dollar is weak and therefore things cost more, but that it, that's not what that means. It's not how it works. Because, it, you know, if that was the case, the Nicaraguan Cordoba is so, it, right, it's just not, and it's not that it, the Canadian dollar is inferior, it's that the, the exchange rate is different. It, it doesn't work, though. It, it's not superior or inferior. There are momentary strengths and weaknesses 
And it, it, yeah, the Canadian dollar is a little bit on the weak side right now, but it's very minor, but it's, it's not like, you know, the Mexican peso, which is really strong. But Mexicans aren't saying the same thing in reverse. Oh, we can just get cars for free. This doesn't work that way. The price goes up with the, the dollar. So to purchase a new vehicle would cost us well in excess of what our paid off relatively new vehicle costs. This is where the fact that their currency does one thing or another will never have an effect on this. So that uh, so too doesn't make any sense here. The amount that they could sell their car for and the amount it costs them to purchase are the same as it would be for an American or for a Nicaraguan or for anyone else that doesn't vary um, with the, the only thing that varies there is the taxes or the prices in the local country. But vehicles are essentially the same price everywhere. If something cost one thousand us dollars in the us it costs the exchange rate of that in canada but if you get paid a thousand in the us you get paid the exchange rate of that in canada same thing with nicaragua it's all the same right how many zeros are at the end or is irrelevant because it's just the exchange rate the actual prices are basically the same in every country small fluctuations but basically the same now if canada used cars go way down and nicaragua used cars go way up just because there's a shortage or whatever that can be an effect it has nothing to do with the currency it has to do with the current supply and demand of the inventory of the used car market alone or weather right canada has more salt on the road so their used cars don't hold up as well there are some things like that that are that are problems in this instance is it more effective uh, to import than buy there's no case where it's better to import than buy like i can't say this enough importing is bad and anything you're going to import you are gonna have to buy with that weaker dollar right so if, if that was the case right if the canadian dollar isn't as strong it's not as strong in canada and not as strong here the fact that you're using it in a different place doesn't change the the power of that canadian dollar so whatever you're picturing isn't affected by what you're saying uh i service and already buy parts on my own which we're going to get to why that doesn't work either. It may be moot since I don't think we'll bring an existing vehicle by the time we relocate, but is there any benefit depending on the existing country of origin? And so that's really, no, to, to the slightest degree, yes. If you're in a market where the prices of the vehicles are a little bit lower and you're able to get the vehicle here with minimal effort. For example, uh, if you were to buy in Mexico and be able to drive it here or Costa Rica and could drive it here with minimal cost, that would give a small advantage to buying there. And in theory, there is a tax advantage for doing the import. It's a one-time import of one vehicle. And if all the costs come together, you might be able to get a slightly lower tax rate because you imported the vehicle, but you're still gonna have to pay taxes in the places that you originate it. So generally any, any differences are very small and that's why they allow you to do it. The idea is simply for people who pre-own a car to minimize how much it hurts when they feel that they have to import it. That's the only reason it exists. This is not some you get a free car kind of deal. Nicaragua is not trying to do that. They want to sell you cars in Nicaragua. They just don't want to overly penalize you for becoming a resident because they know that people who are becoming residents already are forced. There's no way that Nicaragua can fix this for you. They have to sell their house in their old country and they have to get an, a, an apartment or a house in the new country. That goes without saying, but they're able to, in theory, lessen this effect by giving you an option for people who have purchased a vehicle and somehow can't replace it for comparable money. And so they'll let you import it one time because it just gets you through that transition point in your life. Then when you go to replace it, you can buy a new one here or used one here, whatever, um, and, and pay your taxes here because then it's the same as what you would have had to do anywhere else. So it's specifically to just help with this one point that could be slightly painful, but generally isn't very painful. Um, but if you already own a vehicle and you can't sell it for enough and you can't buy one for enough, and like if there's a whole bunch of ands, yes, importing could make sense. But it's not gonna make a lot of sense. It's just gonna be like, okay, this gets me over a hump of a little bit of time where it sort of works, but never is it going to be a great deal. Never are you gonna be like, the thing I wanna do is import. You're never gonna wanna target importing. You're never gonna wanna attempt to import. It's just, ugh, I'm in this situation. I'm gonna be able to drive down. And once you're putting it on a boat, once you're shipping it, any value to import is gone gone by so much. The cost to, to ship a car here will be so extreme. I mean, just think about the cost of gas of driving a car here, if you're coming, especially from Canada. If you're coming from Texas, it takes about 60 hours of driving. If you're coming from the nearest points of Canada, you're looking at much closer to 100 hours of driving. So think about the operational cost of a vehicle. You have to pay for the gas to get it all that way. You have to pay for a driver. It could be you, but someone has to drive that. That's 100 hours of labor 
that could be your time, it could be someone else's. And even if you're looking at minimum labor cost, $10 per hour at a hundred hours, that's a thousand dollars just in the labor to drive it down. And that's really pushing the point. In reality, it's going to take someone four to 10,000 hours because they're going to have to stop and take breaks. You're going to have to use the bathroom. They're going to have to sleep how many times during that time? Nobody can drive 24 hour shifts four t days in a row. They're going to have to, to break that up. At most, you're looking at 12 hour days. Really, you could do it with 12 hour days, but now you're looking at eight days of driving. That's eight nights in hotels. Plus, there's all that time crossing the borders. Plus all the fees and paperwork at every border, that's another 20, 30 hours you're going to have to do minimum. If anything goes wrong at a border, you could be looking at hundreds of hours of stuck at any given border as you go, any number of fees. The amount that it costs to move a car between the countries is generally astronomic. Now, if you're looking to drive down because the drive itself is its own reward, well, that's its own reward. You're doing it and you're basically paying for vacation. But even the simplest circumstance where you're doing the drive yourself and no one, you're not hiring anyone, you can handle everything and you're, you're happy to pay for the hotels and do as much driving as you can as fast as you can. Uh, you're unlikely to ever come up with a scenario, in my opinion, where you're going to be able to make importing a vehicle a cost-effective measure. That's the most difficult thing. And then we've got another question that's going to come up that's going to answer a bunch more of why it's so extremely a bad idea. It's not as simple as just, can I get it there? And what is the sale price versus the buy new price? Now, it is true, no matter where you are, if you have to sell one car and buy another, even if you're getting equal cars, let's say you have a uh, 2010, well, that's too old, a 2015 Toyota Corolla, and it's in you know perfect condition, and you have it in Canada, and you sell it, and you come down, you buy a perfect condition 2015 Toyota Corolla in Nicaragua, are you going to lose money? Absolutely. And this would happen no matter where you are, including if you did it in reverse, sold it in Nicaragua and bought one in Canada. Remember, your currency never is a factor in this. No matter what someone tries to tell you, no matter how it feels like it must be, it is not. That is never the case because you can always, in both countries, convert to US dollars and prove that it's not because you can use the same exchange rate under the hood if you want to. Right, as someone, and this is when you live in Canada or any place that's single currency and you get used to concepts like, well, our dollar's not worth as much as the US dollar, it feels like you were paid less because of that, but your, your salary's higher in, in numerical value because of that to offset it by exactly the amount that it's different under normal circumstances. It, that fluctuates a little bit too by how much you're getting paid, but that's right, it, it, it's all tied together. And so it's never a factor in the purchasing like that. It can be day to day, like, oh, the, the Canadian dollar went down today, the Cordoba went up, and so the difference the difference is a little bit more than usual. Yes, day to day. But in the general sense, the fact that one uh, Canadian dollar is worth roughly 30 Cordoba is, is not a factor. Or else, if it was a factor in the way that you're thinking, everything here would be 130th the price for Canadians and 137th the price for Americans. But it's not the case at all. The price for Americans, whether we're using US dollars or Cordoba, is exactly the same, right? Everything that's $1 here is 37 Cordoba. Anything that's $2 is 72 Cordoba. It doesn't matter which one we use use, the value is exactly the same. The same thing happens with Canadian dollars. So you don't have to worry about that. That's not, but yes, if you're selling and buying, there's going to be some overhead to that. But if you're importing, there's going to be a overhead to that as well. Plus this additional thing that we're going to get to in one of the next questions. All right. This one is from Tom DeSantis, 938. And this one's a comment, not a question. If you become a resident, you have to get a Nicaraguan license and the test is in Spanish and the test giver of the driving part is in Spanish. Yes, this is definitely true. I have mentioned this before in the you have to get a license uh, when you get your residency. And I said there's a little bit of leeway. I talked about it a little bit. Um, but yes, all of that stuff's in Spanish. Now, it is also true, though, most people when they're getting residency have taken some time to learn some Spanish and the kinds of things you have to do for driving are not very difficult when it comes to Spanish. It's not a big deal like it sounds like, but it is more than nothing, right? So just be aware if you're going to get residency. And once again, one of the reasons that we tell so much don't necessarily be in this mad rush to get residency because residency is built around you plan to live here. Now, this is not a country that doesn't recognize English as a language. There are parts of the country that speak English first. So the fact that you speak English presumably because you watch his channel, right? That's why we make that generalization, is is not the big problem from a legal standpoint, but from a practicality standpoint, the majority of the country speaks Spanish, the majority of the country speaks only Spanish, and the majority of documents and, and such are all done in Spanish. And so if you don't speak any Spanish, that can make some of those things difficult. Now, if you're a tourist, people ask a lot, should I come down? I don't speak Spanish. Should that hold me up? No, it should not. Should uh, we well, have problems in joining the country, whether as a tourist or as a, a you know, a, a resident to be? No, it'll be fine. 
but we also say start learning Spanish. All that you can learn is better. Don't let it stop you from coming down that you haven't learned your Spanish yet, but don't let that fact that you can get by without Spanish make you not bother learning Spanish either. There's a happy medium. Go ahead and move down to Nicaragua as soon as you can, but start learning Spanish as soon as you can. And for those who haven't figured out when as soon as you can is for start learning Spanish, it is as soon as this video is done. Get to the end of this video, maybe click on the next one, just let it play in the background and go and get Duolingo started and start your streak. Learn Spanish now, not tomorrow, not tonight, maybe save it, but get it ready on your phone all loaded up. And when you head to the bathroom and you have a few minutes, use that time, learn to use all of your bathroom reading to do Duolingo. It's an incredible way to change your use of your free time. You'll appreciate this because so many little things. Oh, I, you know, now I can just read menus. Now I can read billboards. Now I can read this. Now I can read this. Now I can talk to people. I'm getting more. You get more from your experience by speaking Spanish but don't let it hold you back either. And the sooner you get here, the sooner you'll start learning Spanish here as well. So it all accelerates. But if you race into residency, contrary to the advice that I generally give, there's, there's reasons why you would do it. But for most people, there's no need to race into residency. The residency process will definitely be smoother if you speak a bit of Spanish. And so give yourself some time. There isn't a hurry to get that residency going. The country will tell you when it's time, if they need to. They, it's not, it's very straightforward. So use that time to get some Spanish under your belt so that all of it's a lot easier. And then things like I got to do a driving test in Spanish, no big deal. All right, a Brad's Life asks, are there sanctions on Nicaragua that would impact my ability to trade stocks for a living as an American moving there? I plan on moving with my wife and kids. She is Nicaraguan. Okay, so awesome. Welcome preemptively to Nicaragua. Um, so no, there are no such sanctions whatsoever. And there's multiple reasons for this. The first one is that there's simply no, I mean, there's, there's several reasons for why there's an answer like there is. First, there are no such sanctions. That is not a thing whatsoever. There are absolutely zero sanctions on what you can do while working from Nicaragua. Okay, that is that is in no way sanctioned. There's no one's proposed such a sanction. No one's sure how you could write such a sanction. Uh, they could figure it out. It would not be that bad, but it would be a, an incredibly awkward sanction on Americans and would not be a sanction on Nicaragua in any way. And so that even more so than the sanction video that you will have had uh, just a couple days ago. I'm actually recording this uh, 45 minutes after that one dropped. So there's some proposed sanctions that stop your investment into Nicaragua. That's a stretch as it is to say, oh, we're going to define jobs that you do in America and you're not allowed to do them if you've moved to Nicaragua. That's a problem. We also then have the problem of defining what move to Nicaragua means. So the United States doesn't recognize that concept, nor does Nicaragua for that matter. The idea of move to is purely a thing that people say to each other. It's completely valid. I'm not saying that we shouldn't say it. I talk to my dad and say, hey, I moved to Nicaragua. He knows what I mean. But when I talk to the U.S. government, they don't say, did you move to Nicaragua? They don't ask that question. I don't say those words because that it means something different in every context. Well, where's your tax status? Well, that depends who you're asking as well, because I have a tax status in the US and a tax status in Nicaragua, and the two have no correlation with each other. I could be non-taxable in both. I could be taxable in both. I could be taxable in one or the other. Now, some places have a tax treaty, like Italy and the United States. Then they talk to each other and they figure out what percentage you're in each. But that's only because they're, they have a combined system for doing that and they're doing it together. But if you have independent jurisdictions, these things don't talk to each other. They don't affect each other. My residency in the United States does not affect or have any interaction with my residency in Nicaragua. I have multiple residencies in Nicaragua. I have my regular residency that no one cares about. Then I have my long-term residency that I don't have yet, but I will very soon. That's the one we talk about, don't rush into. The United States doesn't recognize any of those because they're not statuses that exist in the U.S. They're not statuses that exist internationally. They're purely internal designations inside Nicaragua, just as resident in the United States doesn't mean anything to any other country. Citizenship does, but residency does not. And so even residency doesn't mean anything, but moving to, does that mean you're a resident of? Does it mean you're a citizen of? Does it mean you just are vacationing? Do you move somewhere every time you take a vacation? We're going to Cancun for the weekend. Oh, you're moving to Cancun for the weekend? No, I'm taking a vacation. Okay, but when you go to Nicaragua and do the same thing, we say you move to Nicaragua. Well, yeah, because I'm staying longer. Okay, but it's still a vacation. How long is longer? Is it one week, three months, one year, 10 years? People used to vacation at three to 24 months regularly. That's like 150 years ago. 
but that was what vacations were like and people still do that stuff not as much but they still do that stuff so my point is only that all these designations are very soft and we have these things we tend to say like i'm taking a vacation when it's up to a month but when it's beyond a month we tend to say we've moved or we've become a digital nomad or something and and but they're purely unofficial things that humans say to each other and they're not established as having strict meanings and so it's important to when you're looking at you know what sanctions would apply or something those only apply to actual things they can define and moving is not one of those things they can realistically define now what they would say potentially and there are jobs like this but they're normally like department of defense they'll say this job can only be done within the confines of the united states borders you cannot travel to canada you cannot travel to england or anything like that or if you do is fine. They're not saying you can't have vacations in any case that I know of. What they're saying is that you may not sign into work, do any work, be in any way employed during that time. Your vacation time, yes, but you're 100% cut off if you leave the borders. So that's generally just for military and like CIA kind of stuff, right? So that's fine. They can do those things, but they have to block you at the border. And it's not about determining what other country you're going to, it's you can't leave the United States. So this is nothing like that. This is just a normal job. You're allowed to do it from anywhere. It doesn't care, it matter what jurisdiction you're in. If they wanted to put a sanction on you for something like that, they would either have to classify it like military, which they never would, that would be crazy, or they would have to completely sanction the country that you're looking at. So if it was in Nicaragua in this case, they would have to block you from going there, essentially, right? So, which they could do, that would be far more reasonable. This will never happen in a you can't, do this job from Nicaragua before they got to considering that they would say you're not allowed to travel to Nicaragua period close the borders with the US and ban the use of the US passport in Nicaragua you'd still be able to get down here and you'd still have an awful lot of rights it's just like Cuba you can still go there you're not supposed to you can get in trouble but you know Cuba's gonna be let you in and, and it's, it's still a lot of gray area that's what it would be like be like here so the easy answer is Absolutely, you can do that. It's not just that you're allowed to. Currently, you're encouraged to do so. Uh, the Any potential laws or sanctions that are being kicked around by one or two people don't uh, don't exist yet, right? Those are just people talking. Um, the actual laws on the books still encourage you to come to Nicaragua and work. It's part of the Nicaraguan development uh, processes you can see in the State Department and such. They're not pushing them as hard as they do sometimes, but they still exist. So there's still assistance for doing these kinds of jobs from Nicaragua. So absolutely, you're able to do that stuff, no problem whatsoever. This comment kind of out of the... Uh, out of, out of order, uh, but about the, the restaurant thing at the beginning, Truth Seeking always says, that sucks, it seems service around the world is on the decline. Sorry that happened to you. That may be true. I think service around the world may be on the decline, but it's important, I think, in this context to, to realize that this is a cultural thing, and I doubt that the service here was worse than it usually is. And yes, I, I could have done things to to like force the hand to be like, guys, you forgot me. Hey, pay attention. But it, it really is kind of a cultural thing. So I'm not saying that it's not bad. I'm just saying that this is this is status quo uh, for this kind of uh, scenario. All right. Coincidental that these are two from the same person. Truth Seeking always also said or asked. Uh, now, if you have a video on it, or he's not sure if I have a video on it. That's what he says. Uh, but would hiring a local tour guide be something you would suggest for someone staying a month? And uh, if yes, do you happen to know what a fair price would be for the day? So um, so this can go a lot of different ways. I mean, in general, I'm going to say, yeah, probably. Um, but as far as hiring a local tour guide, if you're going to be here for a little while, there's a lot you can do. You don't feel you should not feel you need a local tour guide. Nicaragua is not the kind of place that that you need one, right? It's not like that, but you may want one and that's completely legit. And, and I've been providing those services. I love being a tour guide. It's a lot of fun. It's it's a it's a cool way to spend my time. Now, uh, there's some things you want to really think about. Are you are you looking for a tour guide because you want to do um, traditional tourism? Like, okay, I don't know where in the country to go, so I want someone to be my guide and explain what I'm seeing and take me up to Somoto Canyon, take me to Ometepe, take me to the Corn Islands, take me to Granada, give me the tour of the colonial cities, show me the volcanoes, uh, get me into Managua, give me some food, take me to the waterfront, give me some cultural stuff, and make it so that I'm experiencing the things that people want to see in Nicaragua with some, some additional information generally, right? That's, that's really what makes the tour guide nice and more than a driver. Um, and they can and maybe schedule it, maybe put some of the planning together. Cause I've had some people try to do their own planning and they'll be like, I'm going to go here, then I'm going to go here and then I'm going to go here. And then it turns out they're doing like 10 times the driving that they need to. Cause some people just aren't good at, at 
planning routes or schedules. Um, and sometimes you don't know, right? Oh, this would be good in the morning. This is better in the afternoon because it might rain. Like there's things that a tour guide can really put together for you uh, that would be very difficult as someone who wasn't familiar with the country. So of course that stuff's cool. Um, but so if you're looking at it in that way and you're really looking to have kind of a vacation put together over weeks or a month, um, that can be great. And you're going to find that there's a lot of tour guides who do that. So you have a lot of options depending on what you want to see, where you're going to be based. Um, you know, I know people who do that. Uh, now, they do it for uh, f uh, solo female travelers, uh, but there's people who do it for, for everyone. But I know a group in Esteli that specifically does that for solo female travelers to give them a, a different uh, or, or focused uh, tour service kind of thing. Um, now, if the other thing is you're looking at coming down, but you're not looking to like see the sites necessarily, or maybe yes, but just mixed in with really coming down to look at where you might want to live. And if you're watching this channel, which you are, because otherwise you would not hear me, um, uh, then there, there's a very high chance that you're looking at relocation, at least as an option. Maybe you're not serious about it, but you want to look into it. Well, you're probably pretty serious if you're actually going to hire a tour guide. Then yes, then in that case, coming down and, and getting a tour guide who's focused on relocation could be amazingly fantastic. And I say this as someone who does it, so take it with a grain of salt, but this is something that uh, I provide specifically. Um, and there are some other people like me, but but not anyone like as focused as I am, uh, but there's lots of people who could do it, right? You just have to know the country. Uh, but but going around and then visiting, uh, then a tour guide can really help with like, okay, so you want to know about, we're going to pick something random, suburban living. You're really into the, you don't like downtown living, which is good because Nicaragua doesn't have much, but you don't like small villages. You don't want to be on a farm. You don't want to be on a beach. You want to be nearish to a city, but you want that like bigger, like maybe gated complex lifestyle. You want a restaurants nearby, but you don't want to necessarily walk there. You're okay with getting in a car or getting delivery most days, uh, but you want that, that comfort of a gated community, maybe with a community pool rather than your own. I'm going into too many details, but let's say that's you and you're like, okay, that's not something a normal tour guide or any tour book or even YouTube. YouTube videos, except for maybe mine, are going to be able to help you with it all. That's going to be a mess trying to put that together. Then having a tour guide who's able to, to sit down and say, okay, we're going to go to a bunch of different cities. We're going to go to Managua, we're going to go to Leon, Granada, Masaya, Rivas, we're going to go to some smaller places like San Juan del Sur, and we're going to check out the suburbs or suburb like living in these different places. San Juan del Sur can kind of be described as a suburb without a city. Uh, and, and, and see some of these areas, see what restaurants are like, see what shopping would be like, see what lifestyles are like. What do these gated communities look like? What would real life be that in, in one of those areas? And you can stop by actual homes and visit people in areas that are not touristy at all. Um, then for that, yeah, I think a tour guide is, is almost impossible to do what you would want to do without one uh, because you have to have that access to things. Of course, if you're really ambitious, you could kind of guess where, where suburbs are, drive into them, walk up to houses and be like, hey, I want to look at your house. Is that okay? And you might get somewhere, but having a focused tour guide who knows what they're doing and can really help you with that, I think would be fantastic and really go a long way. Now, how much is that going to cost? Now, it really depends on what you're looking at doing, and there's some things that uh, can go with that or not, depending on the packages. If you're looking for long-term, like weeks or a month, and you want someone that whole time, it's going to bring down the daily cost. If you're just looking for one isolated day, it's going to go way up. If you want to have a Nicaraguan who's just going to take you around and show you some things, it's going to be a lot cheaper. If you want someone like me, who speaks English, who's from the United States, who has done relocation, who can do a lot of extra things uh, and generally brings a Nicaraguan with me. So we have a range of things. It's going to be a lot more expensive. Um, so on, on the low end, I think you're probably looking at very hard to get below 40 or $50 a day. Of course, someone would do it for less than that, but that would be very difficult. And it would not be someone who's, a, who's an experienced tour guide once you get uh, very cheap. Most, I think, of people who are doing that professionally in country are going to be closer to $100 per day simply because they can't do it every day and they have to make enough to pay for the days that they're not working. If you're looking at someone like me, my current prices are $350 per day, but I do provide my own transportation. And for a limited number of people, I can drive them around with me. So I come with transportation. Getting a local person who's going to do it would either you'd have to provide your own transportation or do it on public transportation, which could work depending on what you're trying to do. Or you may have to get transportation separately. You may be able to find someone who does them combined, but that's going to make it more expensive if you need to have transportation. Now, if you're only looking for a tour guide within a city, say you're going to Granada, you just want two, or two days of tour guide in Granada. You don't care about going anywhere else. You don't need that transportation. You just need to bring your tour guide in or find one that's in town. That's going to save some money. Uh, so there's a lot of factors, but I'd say really at the, at the high end for uh, a couple people who fit in a car and you want to travel some places, 350 per day is currently the high end. That's 
I am what I am, right? Um, and on the low end, there's really no reasonable way to get below about $50 and more realistically closer to $100 is what you would expect to be facing on a per day basis. Now, of course, again, if you're doing something for an entire month, you can definitely figure out some deal that would be uh, a lot less expensive on any end uh, rather than looking at it at purely a per day basis. Um, but I do think some of those some of the services can be very valuable, um, which, again, because I offer them, yeah, you have to really temper my opinion on it. But uh, having done it, um, it's really fun to do. But I think that people really do get a lot of um, value generally from having a tour guide who's able to. Uh, and this is where having someone, if you're American or Canadian, having someone with that background who spent a lot of time here uh, is able to interpret what you're seeing into your context to some degree. And I think that has a lot of value, if you, especially if you're not really used to the region. If you've lived here a lot and you just want a tour guide for some very specific things, eh, maybe you're okay without that. But that's some of the biggest value is being able to, for example, to completely pick something out of my hat, uh, is it, you go to Ciudad Sandino and you drive around and you say, okay, so what are we looking at here? Okay, okay. So this wall that looks like an industrial thing, this is actually the wall of a gated community. If we were to go in, it would be like this. And this is what lifestyle would be like that. Well, where do these people work? Okay, so these are the kind of places that are nearby. This is about how far they would commute. Do they drive? Well, some of them would. Some of them are business owners, but some of these are taking public transportation. See this bus stop over here? That runs into this. And it kind of be able to explain what you're looking at and like, well, is this a really poor neighborhood? Is this a really rich neighborhood? And like being able to interpret those things. Because when I first moved here, trust me, it was so much of just everything you saw was like, what am I looking at? And you'd see something and be like, do people live in this shed? And then later you're like, okay, that's actually a fruit stand. And that's not a spot that someone lives in. And this house that I thought wasn't very impressive is actually a really nice house. I just wasn't picturing how people live and didn't really realize what the outsides looked like compared to the insides. There's a lot of things you just, you need experience to, to understand and, and, and interpret. And uh, having done this for people, I think that that's where a lot of the value is, is being able to take a location and say, okay, here's what your opportunities are here. Here's some ideas of what your lifestyle could be if you lived in this particular place. Here's how far it's going to, you know, oh, what would your grocery shopping be like? Well, let's go show you. Let's go look at your local grocery stores. Let's go see how far it is to Price Mart. Let's give you a real idea. This is what your drive would be like. Oh, 45 minutes with that kind of traffic? I could do that, right? Or, oh, three hours and, and then was through the mountains. I don't want to do that ever, let alone once a week. No, no. Okay. This doesn't work for me, right? Little things like that can go a really long way very quickly. And that's where it could be very, quite valuable. All right. This is completely coincidental, but the final question or comment of the day is actually the one I've alluded to in nearly all of the, the, the questions from Frank BDB1142, who comments quite often, not sure if you touched on this, and I have, but I've only like mentioned it in passing. I've like thrown it out there and not recently. But even if you import a vehicle, so, so let this say, I'm going to read this slowly. This is every person who's thinking about bringing in a vehicle. You have to hear this and internalize what it says. Even if you import a vehicle that exists here, it might not be the correct version to get parts. A Toyota 4Runner in the U.S. has different parts than a 4Runner in Latin America, as an example. Now, in general, we point this out a lot, that if you're going to import a car, almost certainly you're going to import something that doesn't exist here. Someone mentioned a Toyota Sienna recently. Toyotas exist here, but Siennas do not, to the best of my knowledge. And bringing in a a model of car that doesn't exist here is a huge problem because getting parts is all but impossible. And any parts you did get would be highly delayed and super expensive. And mechanics would be like, it would be the first, users would always be the first time they ever saw it. And often the only time they ever saw that particular vehicle. Now a trained Toyota mechanic is going to be able to work on a Sienna instead of a Corolla, but there are differences and there's going to be more gotchas and less experience. So there are negatives, but it's not the end of the world. If you want to bring in something we don't have here, say an MG or a Ford or a Chevy, then you're dealing with mechanics who are like, nope, never seen anything like this. I can't get the books. I can't get the parts. There are no dealers. There, this is a huge problem. A lot of people do import Fords and Chevys. So you see them on the roads, but maintenance on that is a nightmare. And that's for ones that are relatively well known. If you're starting to get lesser and lesser known, more and more exotic, these things get really hard, really fast. So if you're bringing in a mark that doesn't exist here, you're basically screwed. We mentioned things like Ferrari and Lamborghini, and yes, you're welcome to do that, but 
good luck every single thing you might as well build your own garage and have all the spare parts brought in because that's that's the only way it's ever going to get anything fixed but if you're looking at say ford or chevy something that's that's still exotic here it's going to be a huge problem people bring those in to show off that they can import a vehicle and that they don't have to worry about reliability or price it really is a showing off how much money you can waste on your vehicle kind of thing if you're bringing in a vehicle that does exist here then you have that risk, as Frank mentioned, that it's often a different model and not all the parts are the same. So you may have a vehicle that is exotic, even though it looks the same as everything else, causing a huge amount of potential costs or risks and people working on it may be very confused because people don't import vehicles here very often. That is super rare. Uh, so it's just, it's so much to go wrong. And that's where people really aren't thinking through, I think, when they're like, for example, the earlier question, right, what about bringing down a Jeep Wrangler? Well, we can't get Jeeps here. We don't sell Jeeps in country. So that might as well be a Ferrari. It is so exotic, no one's going to know what to do. I have never seen a Jeep on the road except for my one friend who brought it down and it was a disaster. And they are lucky they never had to get it fixed while they are here. Two, even if we had a Wrangler here, it would not be the same Wrangler. So all those parts, super exotic, no idea how you would get them. You'd have to custom import every part. So you, if you needed a, you know, a new headlight, you could be looking at a month to get that in. And you'd better have a dealer in the U.S. who's ready to work with you uh, or else you're going to have a big problem. And just as a quick story, we have a completely Nicaraguan car. So this is one. It's the number one uh, car in the country. It's a Toyota Corolla. Uh, I guess the Yaris is the number one, but it's like the number two car in the country. So it doesn't get more common than this. Two. It was purchased from the dealer that handles all the Toyotas in the color in the in the country. It's Casa Pellis. So that is the largest car dealer in the country from their largest mark and their like number two car. It is a completely stock version of that car, and it's a recent year. It's not super recent, but it's recent. Like it's really hard to get a vehicle that is any more by the book common standard than anything else. We have a small part on the car that doesn't usually break that broke. And for four months, we have not been able to get that part replaced. No one knows what to do. And the best guess is to fly to the United States, buy the part, and bring it back in luggage. Literally, that's how hard it is for the best case scenario of a car with a problem. If you're starting to talk about anything that gets away from being super common, super standard, super new, it just gets harder and harder and harder. So the amount that you want to avoid that can't be overstated. This is not a country that you move to if having a custom car or a very special model or something is tantamount to you. Like that just does not make sense. That is a priority for a different part of the world. And not that many people care about, but it's something we just have to say because we do find a lot of pushback from people who are, who are absolutely sure that they want to live here, but they want to do so with a vehicle that if you actually were here already, you'd go, wow, that does not make sense. I mean, I get why a Jeep Wrangler could be a decent vehicle for the roads here. In many cases, it could make sense from a physical manufacturing of the, like how it's designed kind of way. But since we don't have those here, it does not make sense in the real world, unfortunately. Thanks for joining me. Like and subscribe. If you'd like to help support the channel, you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. Please, more of these questions. These are fantastic. This is a great slew of questions and comments today. Get down there and ask your own questions or just say hi, whatever. And if you could, almost no one does this, but make a video question and send that in. That would be amazing. All the instructions on how to do that are down below. But basically horizontal, 4K if you can, 1080p if you can't, 30 frames per second. Get some good lighting on. Use your cell phone. It's not hard. Just, you know, hold it up, talk to it. Get us some video and get on the show. That would be really cool. Thanks for joining me. Tell a friend about the show. Post on social media. I will see all of you tomorrow. And you can go further in helping the show by clicking on one of the videos. It's going to pop up on the screen. Those tell the algorithm that you like the episode and you like to see more of this.